Good morning. I uh, hope everybody's doing well out there. I'd like to welcome you to the uh, Pineland Speaker Series. Uh, today, we're lucky to have with us again, uh, Jen Balava from uh, Burlington County. She's a naturalist with the Burlington County Park System. And she's going to talk with us about uh, lichens and uh, fungi. And the title of the program is uh, Lichen, the Fungus Among Us. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jen. All right, thank you, Joel. Hi, everyone. My job as a naturalist is for the most part doing interpretation outdoors. And every now and then I do indoor lectures as part of our lecture series for the county park system. And this particular presentation is one that I made for that lecture series. And I was actually supposed to do this one uh, for the Pineland short course back in March. So uh, if you did sign up for it back then, and I'm glad you get to see it now. This particular presentation I made for the general public as a way for people to understand the benefits of the fungi kingdom. Because I think a lot of people, not everyone obviously, but I think that there's a negative connotation associated with the word fungus. I think a lot of people might think of things that are kind of nasty like black toenails and food that's been left in the fridge too long but uh, this presentation is about the, the good parts of the fungi kingdom. In fact, uh, two weeks ago, I spoke about invasive fungi, which of course were some of the, of the worst kinds. And this time around, I'll be talking about the opposite, some, the best aspects of the fungi kingdom. So I want to first begin with a little bit of background information on the fungi kingdom. So I'm going to stop my video and go to my presentation. Okay, so all living things are classified into kingdoms. And of course, this presentation is all about the fungi kingdom. And if you, if you can see there, the, the five kingdoms, animals, plants, and then there's protista, which includes algae, and lots of other, a lot of microscopic organisms, and Monera, which is bacteria and viruses. And until very recently, it wasn't until the late 1960s actually, that there, there were just, it was just animals and plants. Those were really the only two kingdoms. And so fungi were classified as plants up until just the late 1960s. So it turns out if, if we look at fungi closely, they don't have roots, stems, leaves, flowers, seeds, or chlorophyll. So obviously that doesn't sound like a plant at all. They can't make their own food like most plants. Instead, they're consumers. They have what we call mycelium for consuming organic matter. And then they have the fruiting body, which is akin to fruit and that's how they reproduce. So plants have a cell wall that's made of cellulose, whereas fungal cell walls are made of chitin. And the exoskeletons of a lot of our um, various arthropods are made of chitin. So they're kind of more related to animals. <laughs> so these are some important terms to understand for the rest of the presentation. Uh, hypha, one hyphae, plural. This is referring to the small fungal filaments that absorb the nutrients. This is how they feed. But for the most part, you'll hear me talk about mycelium, which is the network of all the hyphae together. And the mycelium is really the body of the fungus. It's usually hidden somewhere in the substrate, whatever it happens to be growing in, whether it's underground or in a log and so forth, so forth. And they secrete enzymes to digest organic matter, and then they absorb nutrients through their cell walls. So depending on the species, the mycelium of a fungus could be quite small or 
remarkably huge. In a single cubic inch of soil, there can be more than eight miles of mycelium. And then we have the fruiting body. This is the reproductive structure that contains the spores. And in the case of mushrooms, that's what we think of. When we think of a mushroom, we think of the part that we see above ground, but that's just the fruit. That's the part that contains the spores so that it can spread and make more. But the actual body of the fungus itself is really all, as you can see, hidden in the substrate. So, this is a photo that shows the mycelium under the uh, bark of a, a dying tree, log. So the kingdom of fungi includes mushrooms, mold, mildew, and yeast. The study of fungi is known as mycology. So someone who studies Fungi is known as a mycologist. I am certainly not one. There are over 140,000 known species of fungi, but this number is believed to represent only 5% of the species that exist in nature. There could be as many as four times as many species of plants. Uh, th there's, there's obviously a lot of species that are either microscopic, hidden from our view, and certainly uh, not, not discovered yet. So most mushrooms are inedible, and some are even poisonous to people. And it doesn't matter what color they are. This is very important to understand because most things in nature have warning coloration and are bright to indicate they're poisonous. But with regards to mushrooms, even the plain brown and white ones can be very toxic. So therefore you should never pick wild mushrooms if you're not a mycologist. <laughs> and you certainly shouldn't, shouldn't eat anything that, that looks like something that you would normally buy in a grocery store. And this is a perfect example. This is the destroying angel, which is the most toxic mushroom that we have in our area. This photo was taken in the Pinelands and it's just plain white. So you would never, there's no warning or indication that this is toxic and looks obviously like lots of other white mushrooms that you might eat. So this is a good example to understand that you can't just go and forage wild mushrooms if you don't know what you're doing. Oh, and this, this is just kind of a fun little picture. The toadstool, that, that term is kind of non-scientific, but it, it usually refers to an inedible mushroom in most cultures. So we're gonna talk now about the beneficial roles of fungi. And the most obvious one that I'm sure you all know already is that they're decomposers. Many of them are decomposers. And they're basically nature's recyclers. So we're gonna talk a lot about that in, in just a few minutes. Some of them are highly medicinal. There are obviously quite a few kinds of mold that we that produce antibiotics and other important medicines. The antibacterial effect of penicillin was discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1929. He noted that a fungal colony of penicillin had grown as a contaminant on an agroplate streaked with staph bacteria. So the picture on the bottom left kind of represents what he, an example of what he might have seen. So what it shows is that the, back, the image on the left is showing what Fleming might have seen after five to six days. So the production of penicillin by the fungus has created a zone that's inhibiting the growth of the bacteria. You can see better in the picture on the right. So penicillin and associated cephalosporins 
are both important groups of antibiotics. And cyclosporine is another important member of the fungi kingdom that reduces the risk of rejection after organ transplants. Uh, this is really cool. Um, some of you might have heard of Utzi the Iceman. He was, is a well-preserved mummy that was, dis that was from 3300 BC and was found in the Alps on the border of Austria and Italy in 1991. Among many interesting things that they found with Utzi were two species of mushrooms and here they are circled here. Both of these mushrooms are kinds of polypores, but they were used for different purposes. The one on the left, number 20, was a tinder fungus. And as the name suggests, this was used with flint and steel to start a fire. And when dry, it could be pounded into a felt like material that kept embers smoldering. So this was used to carry fire starting back in 3300 BC, which is absolutely insanely cool. So that is the tinder fungus. And now there are actually uh, traditional medicinal uses of tinder fungus as well. The other species he was carrying was a birch polypore. And these are the white, uh, the white mushrooms that you see. They, he had them strung on leather straps. <clears throat> so the Birch polypores, it turns out, after they did an examination of Utzi's body, it showed that, they, that he had an intestinal parasite known as whipworm. And amazingly, this birch polypore is known to contain an acid that has been shown to be especially effective at killing whipworm parasites. So he is carrying essentially a first aid kit and a uh, and fire starting kit with him, and all of this perfectly preserved. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about some other beneficial roles of fungi. I haven't talked about yeast yet. Yeast are strange. They're unicellular microscopic fungi, and yeast cells produce and modify proteins in a manner that's similar to human cells, which makes them important for DNA experiments and genetic research. Now, ancient humans acquired wild yeast from the environment and used them to ferment sugars into carbon dioxide and ethanol under anaerobic conditions, which creates alcohol. It's now, uh, let's see, it was Louis Pasteur who was actually instrumental in developing a reliable strain of brewer's yeast for the French brewing industry in the late 1850s. And then there's baker's yeast, which is an important ingredient in bread. Before isolated yeast became available in modern times, humans simply let dough collect yeast from the air and rise over a period of hours or days. And then the small piece of leavened dough was saved and used as a starter for the next batch, much in the same way that sourdough bread is used and made today. Of course, mushrooms are eaten by people all over the world. And some are even considered pest control. So there are some kinds of fungi that parasitize insect pests. And this one that I, that I have on the screen is actually one species that grows naturally in the soil and acts as a parasite on various insect pets, pests like aphids, whiteflies, thrips, grasshoppers, and some beetles. And it's currently being tested as a possible biological control agent for the recent spread of emerald ash borer. So this is something very exciting to look and see what the researchers find with regards to this particular species as a biological control. So I wanna spend 
the most time talking about mycorrhizal connections with plants. So what this means is basically a, an association of plant roots in connection with the fungus hyphae. So it literally means fungus root. I want to share with you a quote from my old college ecology uh, textbook on the entry for mycorrhizae, which said, it is almost impossible to overstate the importance of this co-action in plant growth. Many functions that we regard as being done by roots are actually performed by the plant fungus union and are done poorly or not at all if the fungus is absent. So I'll be talking a lot about mycorrhizal connections with plants. This is important to know because there are three main groups of fungi. Those that feed on living organisms, which are the parasitic kind. Those that are saprophytic, these are the recyclers, the decomposers that break down dead or, or dying organic matter. And then there's the mycorrhizal fungi, which form that symbiotic relationship with the roots of plants. So uh, parasitic is self-explanatory. That's going to be found living, found on living organisms. If we look at photos of saprophytic examples of mushrooms, you can see they're going to be growing on material that's clearly dead or dying, like this tree stump or rotting logs. Uh, most of the time, uh, turkey tail and polypores are good examples of saprophytic fungi. You could see more examples here, and even the morels in the top right are considered saprophytic. So these are all going to be growing on dead or, or dying matter and recycling it, decomposing it. And then we have the mycorrhizal fungi. So these are going to be looking like they're just coming out of the ground, not necessarily growing on something living or dying. And this one that's shown here is, a, is an agaric, which is mycorrhizal. And this particular parasol mushroom is forming a fairy ring. A fairy ring is a naturally occurring ring or arc of mushrooms. And the rings grow and become stable over time as the fungus grows and seeks food underground. The mycelium of the fungus growing under the ground absorbs nutrients as it grows, moving from the center outward. So when the nutrients in the center are exhausted, it keeps growing out from the center. And the ends of the mycelium send up the, the fruiting bodies, the mushrooms. And so this, after the center is exhausted, it forms this living ring around the outside from which the mushrooms arise. There are about 60 mushroom species which can grow in this fairy ring pattern. What is required is simply an evenly composed substrate, which is why grass is where we are most likely to see them. These are more examples of mycorrhizal mushrooms. And there's the old man of the woods in the right corner there. And these are chanterelles. And this is one of my favorites. This is an earth star. Earth stars are pretty common in the pinelands. They look like strange starfish. And that white capsule in the middle is where the spores are held. And earth stars have mycorrhizal associations with oak and pine. So they're attached to oak and pine roots in the sandy soils of the pinelands. So many sources estimate that somewhere between 85 to 90% of land plants live in some kind of association with mycorrhizal fungi. Some mycorrhizae will actually penetrate the plant's root cells, and those are called endomycorrhizae. And they allow for 
the most efficient transfer of nutrients and carbon between the fungi and the plant. So the, the vast majority of our vascular plants have this association, the endomycorrhizae. And then the others, about 5% of vascular plants have ectomycorrhizae, which means that instead of penetrating the actual root cell of the plant, it just forms a fungal sheath around the roots of the plants. And while there aren't as many plants that use this method, it does happen to include some of our most common forest trees like pine, oak, beech, birch, and hickory. A single tree may have mycorrhizae from several different species of fungus. And some fungus may have a narrow range of plants that they associate with, while other species of, fung of fungi have a much larger range of host plants. It just depends on the species. So the main thing to understand here is that the fungi are colonizing the root system of the host plant and in, in turn providing incredible amount of water and nutrients that the plant roots wouldn't be able to get on their own. And then in, as a, this is not a one way road, of course the fungi can't create its own food. So the plant is providing carbohydrates as a result of photosynthesis to the fungi. So in general, the higher fungal diversity of various mycorrhizal fungi, the higher plant diversity you can have. These are some graphics that illustrate that pathway, the transfer of nutrients and water from the fungus to the, the plant, and then the transfer of carbohydrates from the plant to the fungus. So it's a symbiotic relationship. So again, here you can see there are, obviously the fungus needs food. So it's getting that from the plant itself and the plant is benefiting a lot. It's getting all kinds, it's getting a lot more water and nutrients that it wouldn't be able to get on its own. It's able to deter herbivores better, have just an overall better tolerance of environmental stresses. And you can see in the pictures there that of the, the plants that were planted with and without mycorrhizal fungi. So it, it definitely makes a difference in their, their growth and the amount of nutrients they can, they can access. These graphics are showing how things that are connected in the, in the forest are benefiting from these mycorrhizal connections. So the seedling, you can see here how nutrients can flow from parent trees to seedling trees through the mycorrhizal network. And Dr. Suzanne Samard had uh, published an article in the journal Nature in 1997 and first coined the term wood wide web to describe this unbelievable network. This, the, the flow of nutrients from parent plants to seedlings can increase the survival rate of their own seedlings by four times. Her TED talk that she did in June of 2016 called How Trees Talk to Each Other is absolutely wonderful and I highly recommend it. It's well worth the time to watch it. So the graphic on the right is a screenshot from her TED talk showing basically how carbon is and nutrients flow through the mycorrhizal network or the wood wide web from a parent plant to the uh, seedling. And all of this of course leads to increased resilience of the forest to future stresses. So in the pinelands, we have quite a few species of orchids and other unusual plants. 
Orchids are rare for a reason. Their seed pods have no food for the growing embryo. So it's, it's very strange. They need some other kind of mycorrhizal connection with a fungus in order to germinate. And this can take years to form. So this is one of the reasons why they're, first of all, not very common, and two, can never be uh, dug up and transplanted. So in the case of the pink lady slipper, which is one of the more um, regularly seen orchids in the pinelands, this one is connected to the Rusula genus of mushroom, which we're gonna look at on the next slide. There's also some weird, unusual plants that don't have chlorophyll. They don't make their own food and they don't have leaves. Indian pipe and pine sap are some such examples. And they are also fully dependent on these mycorrhizal connections. It was long thought that they were parasitic on tree roots. But here you can see that if you have a pine or oak tree in the pinelands, you have the connection to the Rusula genus of mushroom. And then those mycelium are connected to the Indian pipe and providing that network transfer of nutrients between the tree and the, and the Indian pipe or non-chlorophyll producing plant. And this is just another example uh, of the Pacific Northwest showing how a particular mycorrhizal fungus is key to the, to the food chain. Of course, in the old growth Douglas fir forest of the Pacific Northwest, there are var various species, three species of squirrels, including the Northern flying squirrel, and they all eat truffles. The squirrels, as they move around and feed on the truffles, spread the spores throughout the forest so that the fungus are constantly colonizing more roots of the Douglas fir, which helps the trees grow. And then the squirrels in turn are prey for the spotted owl, which of course needs the old growth Douglas fir as well. So, but without the, the mycorrhizal connection of this particular type of mushroom, the food chain wouldn't work well at all or wouldn't function. So I definitely wanted to mention the mustard family, which is known as the Brassicaceae family. And this is non-mycorrhizal. Mean, that means it doesn't form mycorrhizal connections with plants, or with fungi or mother. And this is important to know if you are a gardener or grow things, uh, vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, radishes, turnips, Brussels sprouts, and kale. They're all in the mustard family. So if you're growing these, you should put them either together, but not with members of other plant families because they could suppress the growth of the other plants. So you should either separate them out from your other vegetables or keep the mustard plants together. And two weeks ago, actually, I talked about invasive plants, and one of them was garlic mustard, which is obviously is in this family. And they found that garlic mustard can actually suppress mycorrhizal fungi with special antifungal chemicals. All right, so that's an overview of the fungi kingdom as a whole. I wanna move on to the next section, which is about lichens. These are really strange, but fascinating organisms. They're what we call fungi that have taken up farming. Lichens are a combination of a fungi and some kind of photosynthetic counterpart. And in the case of what we're talking about today, it's a fungus and a green algae working together. 90% of the time, lichens form this partnership, the fungus and an algae. 
the other 10% of the time, lichens form a connection with cyanobacteria instead of algae as their photosynthetic component. And these occur in environments like the desert, desert and tundra where there's basically no nitrogen because cyanobacteria are nitrogen fixers as well as being photosynthetic. So the algae in this case contains the chlorophyll and it's providing food, right? The, all this time we talked about fungi are consumers, they don't create their own food, but the algae is able to do that because it's photosynthetic it contains chlorophyll. So it's providing the fungus with food. And so therefore, the lichen is, is not consuming organic matter. It's actually, have, the algae is providing food for the fungus. And the fungus anchors the organism, traps water and nutrients, and most importantly, provides the spores to allow it to reproduce. So all lichens have a fungus component and most of the time it's an algae combined with it. And this is really a perfect example of symbiosis, which means two organisms working together for mutual benefit. Lichens are extremely hardy. They're some of the hardiest of all organisms on earth. They can, they can withstand long periods of drought, freezing temperatures, it makes it possible for them to exist where nothing else can. They usually grow in thick mats on trees, on the ground, or on rocks. They're considered the dominant ground cover on 8% of the Earth's surface. They can so stabilize the soil. And we're gonna talk about how some kinds of lichens are air pollution indicators. Those 10% uh, of lichens that have cyanobacteria instead of algae actually have the ability to fix nitrogen. And lichens are definitely pioneer species, being able to grow where nothing else can. And then once it establishes itself, then other things can grow around it. So one thing I wanna make sure everyone understands is that lichens are not harmful to plants. Unlike mushrooms, they do not digest wood. If you see lichens on a tree, it does not mean that the tree is dying. It doesn't mean that the, the lichens are doing something harmful at all. Lichens don't harm plants. They're, the, the fungus is laying on the surface. The algae, as I said, is creating food for it. It is not digesting any part of the substrate. It just so happens that a lot of times lichens are on dead trunks or branches of trees simply because they want to get the light from the sun. And if the leaves are providing too much shade, well, then they'll, they'll be more likely to grow on an area where there's more sun. Lichens can only photosynthesize when there is moisture. So there are three groups of lichens. Crustose, which means crusty. These are generally found on rocks and are not dimensional. And we have folios. These are really common lichens. We, ha we have a lot of these in, in our area. And folios means leafy. So these are two-dimensional. It has a definite top and bottom. And the third group is fruticose. So the fruticose are three-dimensional, usually branched or uh, a little like cup formations, sort of uh, looking like antlers or strings. These are all examples of fruticose lichens. And there's a lot of, of these in the pinelands as well. So I just wanna show you this for, for comparison because it looks like some of the stringy fruticose lichens 
But Spanish moss that we find in the Southeast is not a moss <laughs> and it's certainly not a lichen either. It's actually a bromeliad, which is a type of what we call an epiphyte. It's a plant that has aerial roots and it lives on trees and it actually does produce flowers. So this is definitely a plant, but again, not, not lichen and not moss. So now we're going to look at how lichens can be indicators of air quality. So it, the reason why it's important to know the three groups, crustos, folios, and fruticose, is because the folios and fruticose lichens are more sensitive in general to atmospheric pollution. So their presence can indicate better air quality. In general, the more folios and fruticose lichen species, the cleaner the air, especially combinations of both. And the, the, you can see the various genera listed there. Those are the ones that indicate the cleanest air quality. And the Usnea is the one pictured with the perula inside it. Now there are three very common folios, lichens that are found everywhere, certainly throughout our state. And these are pollution tolerant. So these would not be considered air quality indicators because they're found everywhere regardless of the air quality. So these, these three we see everywhere. So these are, these are ones to, to note and recognize. So just a few more examples. This chart came from a report in Europe, but basically it just shows that when you have a rich diversity of lichens, you have a very low air pollution load. And then when you have areas that are poor in, in species diversity of lichens, you have, that indicates a much higher air pollution load. These maps in the United States show are typical, some of our air pollutants that are, that lichens are sensitive to, nitrate and sulfate. And so some of the areas where we see the highest diversity of lichens are places where we don't have a lot of that kind of air pollution. For instance, the Pacific Northwest and Maine, certain areas like that, but also the New Jersey Pinelands, because obviously the Pinelands is a very kind of more remote area away from industrialization. And we have a great diversity of lichens that indicate that the air quality is definitely better there than elsewhere in New Jersey. And I had to include this, this comic, even though I can't hear the audience laughing. These are vultures. Okay, so lichens and animals. So there are definitely quite a few animals that use lichens in different ways. There are at least 50 species of birds that use lichens as nesting material. Specifically hummingbirds, gnat catchers, and some fly catchers, you can actually see attaching lichen to the outside of the nest which is used as camouflage. I'm gonna show you some of my pictures of that on the next slide. And then there are some animals that use lichens as camouflage for themselves. So we'll look at that as well. So here are some examples of, yeah, there's a hummingbird nest on the left. You can see she stuck bits of lichen over top of the nest to camouflage it. And same thing with the gnat catcher on the right. These birds use a lot of spider web silk and tent caterpillar silk, which is sticky. And then they put the, the lichens uh, on, the, on the surface of that camouflage it. These photos show that northern perulas 
type of warbler like to hide their nests in Usnea lichens in the northern part of our country. So that's a that's a seems like a good strategy, a good place to to hide. These are some more examples of animals using lichen as camouflage. There's lots of different moth caterpillars. There are gray tree frogs that pretend they're lichen. And one of the most notable examples is the lacewing larva. So lacewing larva are highly beneficial predators. They eat a lot of insect pests like aphids and mites. And they like to put bits of lichen over top of their bodies so that they can walk around not only being camouflaged from birds from above, but also to be able to sneak up on their prey. So the picture on the top right shows a lacewing larva that's covered in lichen. And if you spend enough time looking at a tree trunk, eventually you'll see moving lichen on the tree. And that's, that's probably the, the lacewing larva moving around. And that picture on the bottom shows what it looks like from underneath. Now, most lichens are kind of bitter tasting to a lot of animals, but there are certainly certain kinds of animals that do eat lichens as a part of their diet, especially in areas that don't have a lot of vegetation in colder months. So the the one that you, the lichen, the fruticose lichen that you see in this picture is reindeer lichen, which unfortunately the common name is often reindeer moss, which of course it's not a moss, it's a lichen. And it's called that because it's 90% of the reindeer's diet in various tundra environments. And there's other, as you can see, there's lots of other mammals that will eat lichens, especially as I said, in the winter time. And birds that are known to eat lichens generally, again, in the winter are turkey and grouse. And then there are definitely some invertebrates, mostly those that live in the, or in the ground or close to the ground, and definitely quite a few moth caterpillars. There are definitely various cultures around the world that eat certain kinds of lichens. And then there are some that like this, it just, it's everything about it. It sounds bad and it looks bad. This is called rock tripe. And this is in the Umbilicaria genus. It's found in rocky areas of the Northern US. And this is only eaten in times for emergency survival situations. So it turns out that it was boiled by Washington's troops in Valley Forge. Again, emergency survival. And then there's this, this kind, which is known as Iceland lichen, or sometimes Iceland moss. And it's a lichen that's found mostly in northern areas of are both our country and in Europe. And in earlier times, it was, it was used um, ground, added to wheat flour in times of famine and used more like in breads, porridges and soups. Some certain kinds of fibrous lichens have been incorporated into clothing we definitely get certain colored dyes from lichens. For instance, browns for tweed uh, comes from certain kinds of lichens. This particular species that you see here, the wolf lichen is a significant source of yellow dye in North America. It yields a yellow dye when boiled in water and Native Americans throughout much of this lichens range traditionally made yellow dyes from this lichen. Then there's royal purple. So 
the gland of a Mediterranean snail was the only source of purple dye in Europe prior to the 1400s. So only royalty had purple clothes until dyes from lichens were discovered. And they came from these two genera, Rosella and Ocrelechia, which were found um, near the Mediterranean. So when they basically yield a purple dye when steeped in ammonia. So that let regular people have purple clothes after that. Litmus paper, this is the pH indicator strips and the dye for that. It comes also from the Rosella genus of lichen. There's even a species that's used in perfume. There are quite a lot of antibiotic properties in certain kinds of lichen. It's been estimated that 50% of all lichen species have some sort of antibiotic property. It happens that usnea contains the antibiotic called usnic acid. And that's one of the most potent lichen antibiotics commonly used in traditional medicine. For at least a thousand years, Native Americans applied compresses of usnea to severe wounds to prevent infection. And that's the usnea lichen, that's the stringy one. And that same yellow dye lichen was also used as poison, unfortunately. And then we also see that a lot of lichens are used for decorative purposes. So there are certainly negative impacts on fungi and as you can imagine on lichens, we saw that air pollution definitely affects them. So uh, for both fungi and lichens as a whole, nitrogen may over acidify the soil, which decreases mycorrhizal connections. Obviously, if there's deforestation or any kind of development that removes the topsoil, that's going to devastate the connections, especially the mycorrhizal fungi. Certain kinds of invasive species, especially garlic mustard, can have negative impacts on beneficial fungi. And climate change is also having some negative impacts on certain kinds of fungi. The Royal Botanical Garden in London came out with State of the World's Fungi Report in 2018. They said the climatic changes will affect fungi species ability to adapt, migrate between and reside within ecosystems. Some climate impact is already apparent. The affecting fungal reproduction, geographic distributions and physiology, which have already changed markedly in the last few decades. So in conclusion, the association of fungi with plants through mycorrhizal connections allows for better root formation of the plant, fewer root diseases and, so and soil pest problems, and in general, therefore requires less watering and fertilizer. Undisturbed soils are full of beneficial soil organisms, including the mycorrhizal fungi. Many of our common practices can degrade the mycorrhizal potential of the soil, such as tillage, and removal of the topsoil, erosion, compaction, invasion of weeds, and leaving soils fallow. These are all activities that can reduce or eliminate beneficial soil fungi. Scientific studies show that certain kinds of mycorrhizal fungal populations are slow to recolonize unless there's close access to natural areas that can act as a source of mycorrhizal spores to repopulate the affected area. So 
So we need to encourage mycorrhizae whenever possible. And in addition to avoiding the things I just mentioned, we can add compost on top of soil of the soil and letting it decay naturally instead of tilling it and, and so forth. <clears throat> Reintroducing mycorrhizal fungi in areas where they've been lost can it improve plant performance with less water and fertilizer. And they are available uh, from several companies, but it's not really necessary unless the soil population has been truly damaged. And to wrap up what we learned about lichens, we know they're important pioneer species. They provide food, nesting material, and camouflage for many animals. Provide many useful ingredients, and dyes, and medicines. And they can indicate the quality of the air by their presence or absence with regards to some of the folios and fruticose lichens. So if you want to learn more ways that mushrooms can save the world. You can check out this YouTube video. It's a TED talk where Paul Stamets talks about all these different ways that mushrooms can basically solve some pretty serious uh, problems. It's 18 minutes long, but the main explanation on the ways mushrooms can save the world starts at about eight minutes in. So you can check that out in addition to Suzanne Samard's TED Talk, How Trees Talk to Each Other. Highly recommend that too. So now, are you liking the fungus among us? All right, I'm gonna leave it open to questions. And I thank you for listening today. I hope you learned something interesting about the kingdom of fungi you didn't know before. All right, Jen, that was really informative. And uh, I learned a couple of really neat things. I really liked that beginning, especially with the Iceman. That was some interesting uh, yeah. things way back when, uh, mm -hmm. you know, people still were figuring things out. Yep. So that's really interesting. It was also really good. You know, a lot of those terms are very complicated and you were able to really boil things down into uh, and the processes too to really uh, make it easily to understand the connections between the trees and the, the fungi. That was that was uh, pretty, pretty informative. Thanks. So if anybody's out there has a question for Jen, please uh, call in. The number's on the screen, and we'll be glad to uh, take your questions. I thought it was important too that you pointed out that when you see the lichens growing on trees, it doesn't mean the tree is dead. Uh, yeah, that, that was a pretty because that's a pretty common misconception that's out there. Yes, I actually the very first time I did this presentation, that was the most frequently asked question, and I said, "Okay, I'm putting that in on its own side." And that's that is very, very often uh, mistaken, uh, very common misconception, and I, I. Uh, I think a lot of people remove lichens from trees because they think they're detrimental. Yep.
Okay. We'll give it a, another minute or so. Uh, this uh, it will be the first time no one's called in with a question, I believe, if mm. uh, we uh, continue on this path. Are, uh, were there people watching? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I uh, checked out and went over to the YouTube and uh, there was a number of people watching. Uh, I think we had about 26 when we started and then the number increased um, as we're going out. Oh, we got a person waiting. Let's bring them in. Hello, you are uh, on the air. Hey, uh, this is uh, Monica, and uh, I had a question for Jen regarding um, the use of glyphosate and if there's been any research on how that um, affects the my mycorrhizal, am I pronouncing that right, um, fungus and its symbiotic relationship with um, other plants. Does it, uh, does it, I would assume it would damage it, but has, has there been any research on the effects of it? Well, that's a great question. I'm um, sorry, I, I don't I don't know. I have not read any research on the effects of glyphosate on mycorrhizal connections. Okay, well, something to definitely look into. Yeah. Well, that's it for me. Okay, thanks <laughs> Thank for your, you. thanks for calling. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, and we have another caller. Thanks. Bye bye. Hello. Hello, you are live. Oh, hi, Joel. Uh, this is Mark Lobauer. I just wanted to thank Jen uh, for another terrific talk and uh, to ask where would I go in the Pinelands to find one of those Earth stars? They look fascinating, and I've, I've never seen one that, I, that I'm aware of. Oh, gosh. Well, Earth stars are they're connected to pine and oak, <laughs> and they're found in open, sandy areas. So they generally come up in August. So oh, I would, okay. around mid-August, mid to late August is when I see them emerging. I've seen them anywhere that's, you know, you don't want to go in like a, like a really dense part of the woods, but anywhere that has oak or, and pine, which is most of the pinelands, that has sure. a kind of more open area that's nice and, you know, the thick sugar sand is perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to go look for them with a the camera this August. <laughs> Thanks again, Jen. Oh, uh, you're welcome. Bye bye. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Hello, uh, you are live with a question. Yes, hi, uh, Jen. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, question for you: um, I know mosses are not fungi or lichens, but how are they integrated in the uh, relationship with the with the other species? So mosses are are not. So everything that I talked about today, with regards to connect mycorrhizal connections, was that of vascular plants. And mosses are not vascular plants. Okay. So they don't they don't form connections with the the fungal mycelium. Great. Okay. Well, thank thank you for your information. Great presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for watching. Okay, that was great. So there was some folks out there. Uh, we'll hold <laughs> for a couple more minutes, and uh, there are some really good questions. It's it's great for that uh, feedback uh, from the public. No problems with the audio this time. Audio was very smooth. Uh, your your pace was very good, and uh, everything went uh, very very uh, very well. Okay, good. It uh, started correctly without a hitch, so it was probably one of our more successful uh, um, presentations so far, this uh, new uh, world we live in with uh, webinars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what you said the first time when we had all the problems, there were like over 100 people, of course, and now this time uh, it worked and there weren't as many people. <laughs> right, but the best, the best thing is you know, basically because we created an archive so yeah. all this is there and anybody can watch it at any time. Exactly. Uh, we've been noticing too, like going back that people are really playing them uh, on a, a, you know, a lot more after the actual live uh, um, stream was over. So yeah. Was yeah. That, that's, it's, it's great. I mean, I know there's a lot of people that are, that are busy that it's the holiday weekend coming up, but they, they can watch in any time. Yeah. So. We'll just give it one more minute, and uh, if uh, anybody else has 
uh, out there, it's uh, it's time to call now. And uh, our next presentation is going to be July 9th. And actually, uh, I'm going to be the speaker, and I'm going to talk about Pinelands history, kind of talk about how where we are today and kind of how the uh, Pinelands and Pine Barrens kind of got us there. And uh, it's going to be next uh, Thursday at 10 o'clock. Um, on July 16th, Marilyn Sobel, one of the Pinelands Commission Research Scientists, is going to talk with us about some of the unique Pinelands plants. Um, on July 23rd, Karen Walzer uh, from the Barnegat Bay Partnership and Becky the Boys coming back from the Ocean County Soil Conservation District. And they're going to talk about combating climate change with a Jersey friendly yard. Uh, that'll be a very practical program. And then on uh, July 30th, uh, the cultural resource uh, specialist from the New Jersey Pinelands Commission, uh, Tony McNichols, is going to talk about uh, His Majesty's Infernal Nuisance, which is a history presentation about the um, Molka uh, River area privateers and uh, the Revolutionary War. And that's uh, for the history buffs out there, that's certainly to be a uh, really interesting program. And that's uh, our July lineup. Uh, in the near future, we're going to announce our August lineup. And uh, we'll have a press release and uh, have that out in the you know coming days. On that note, I think I'm going to wrap things up. Jen, great presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, you've really contributed greatly to this summer speaker series. And I appreciate your efforts and patience with uh, some of the headaches we had uh, last time. Okay, thanks, Joel. I I uh, I'm glad it worked out. All right, everybody have a great day 